we're going to begin with a story. And this is a story that we as medical professionals join too late. We join at the end of a long process that results in a disease. And this is the story of Mr. Jones losing his vision. Our involvement began when we were consulted to see a patient with a red eye emergently. So when I walked into the room, I knew right away. The recognition was immediate, except it wasn't about his exam, it was about the feelings in the room. When I examined him, I found that his red eye was in fact the end of diabetic retinopathy, a long pathway of microvascular disease which resulted for him in a red eye which brought him to the office. However, this also resulted the very same day that I met Mr. Jones was the same day that he had emergency laser and emergency surgery the next day and despite all of those interventions, he still lost his sight. That is diabetic retinopathy presenting at its end stage as it often does. What you need to know about diabetic eye disease is that it has a long latency and that predisposes to denial. The point is that what we see, what we want to do is intervene between denial and despair. And we want to do, have our imaging program become right in the center there. So the problem is that diabetes remains one of the leading causes of vision loss. In fact, it is the most common cause of vision loss for people age 20 between age 20 and age 70. Despite that, 90% of those patients could have avoided vision loss with proper screening. The problem is, in fact, more complex. The disease itself we discussed, but late treatment is costly. In addition, the government and regulatory agencies recognize themselves that their screening is valuable and there are penalties and incentives associated um, with screening for diabetics. But there are barriers to treatment. The low screening rate is across the country. What is that about? Well, there's a poor patient experience. Um, and as an ophthalmologist, I find it hard to understand, but most patients don't like to be dilated. When they come in for dilation, they are blurred for the rest of the day. They are um, often not able to work for the rest of the day, and they may even need someone to come with them to drive them back home. In addition, we have issues with poor documentation. And that means, you know, Documentation, if, even for patients that had actually had eye exams, if it isn't documented, then we cannot readily meet these metrics. So documentation feeds the metrics and it's not being done. What does work is to provide on-site screening service for diabetic patients at Penn using an undilated retinal imaging at remote sites. We call this eyes on site. And what's new here is not the imaging. Imaging has been in ophthalmology forever. What is new is the camera, which allows for undilated images, and the delivery of having these images performed outside the ophthalmologist's office. Our team is robust and multifactorial. And what we learned, well, we learned many things, as you'll see, but the most important thing is that the real innovation is not actually about the technology. The technology enabled it. The real innovation is about changing our habitual ways of thinking. And that's what we found in this accelerator program that we are actually able to do. We are ready to screen for diabetic services. We are ready, our collaborators are ready, and most importantly, our patients are ready. Very important slide. We learned through analysis that there were 32,000 patients who had appointments at Penn who were diabetic and yet were non-adherent with their diabetic eye exams. We can look at this as 32,000 missed opportunities, in the future, we want to look at this as 32,000 times we hit every point of contact with our patients and made the most of it. If you look, the density of our diabetic patients drove our pilot sites, and accordingly, we conducted two pilots at Perlman and one at Primary Care. A pilot looked like this. A camera, this is an undilated retinal imaging camera, a sign. A technician, who you can't see but required minimal training, able to operate this very easily. Diabetics were identified, images acquired, images interpreted, results communicated back to the patient and to the provider. This is fascinating. So if you're not an ophthalmologist, the results here may mean nothing to you. If you are, you'll recognize at the top these are very high numbers of disease. What you see in blue is diabetic retinopathy. That's a high percentage for a small screening pilot. What you see in green is glaucoma. That's an extraordinarily high number of patients who were found either to have glaucoma or to be glaucoma suspects. And then the black dots are other incidental findings, which at Penn are quite significant, and we'll review those later. 
This, in order to extrapolate our findings to GPRO and HEDIS, we developed something called a daily adherence rate. And that means we assessed the compliant rate, the adherence rate of the patients that morning when they came in. We looked at the clinic schedule, 22% compliance when you start. By the end of the day, with one day of screening, 81% compliance. So why not 100%? Excellent question. And that's because some of the images are not interpretable, but that's okay too, because uninterpretable images are also associated with disease. So those patients need to be seen anyway. They could even be considered positives. What we learned is that cost avoidance far exceeds the operational cost of this program. And if you look at the graph here, what you'll see, cost of screening but with telemedicine, the cost of the exam, and then DME is diabetic macular edema, which is one of the first visually significant complications of diabetes. And it jumps immediately. The price goes to 4000 a year for one eye, one patient. If you allow that patient to progress to proliferative retinopathy, as Mr. Jones did, then the cost will jump to 16000 a year. If you think back to those 32,000 patients that we failed to screen, and if you say we will screen 10% of them, and if we, present, we prevent those patients from developing diabetic macular edema, we can save a million dollars in just one year. That's about $20,000 a week for operational costs. If you think about it on an institutional level, GPRO and HEDIS are easily worth a million dollars a year. That's, you know, it could be even quite more significant than that if you think about the incentive payments that are foregone and the penalties that will be incurred if we fail to meet these metrics. Regardless, that drives reputation and ranking, which is fundamental to the institution. So in summary, we did learn that we can capture these images, we can get high quality images, we can interpret, we can diagnose retinopathy outside the ophthalmologist's office, we can communicate with our patients and providers, and we can document the, this in our EMR. So who will we best serve and where will we best serve them? We propose two locations, one permanent site, and one rotating schedule where we can provide block time for diabetic patients. And the camera itself is mobile, so we can go to different sites. Now I need to take a moment to talk about all of those incidentals and those very high numbers of patients with glaucoma. And I'm going to start first by talking about this patient, who's a patient I met in my own clinic, came to me with her son and an electric bill. And her son says, the lights are on 24 hours a day. Why is that? Why is there not enough light? And the answer is because her optic nerve has been consumed by glaucoma. Well, 20 years ago, her optic nerve probably looked like that healthy optic nerve over there. But more importantly, five years ago, her optic nerve may have looked like this patient who we met at a primary care screening. Glaucoma was responsible for 37% of those incidental findings. Many of them were UPHS employees. Bringing this to scale will require many steps, as you see listed here. We won't go through all of them. Very importantly, we'll need IT support, and we'll need to remove any disincentives for patients to sit down and have the screening. Now, it is most important to our program and our team to emphasize that we are in a unique position to provide value, and this is why. We have a common EMR, and that means we can communicate well. We have a common faculty. These images, all that you see here, brought us together. We have common facilities. These patients were already on site. And let me introduce you to our asymptomatic patients who sat for our screening. This is a patient who has a presumed ocular tumor or transplant retinopathy. This is a patient who has advancing sight-threatening retinopathy who tells me everything is fine. This patient has a retinal degeneration maintaining a small island of 20-20 vision, all just walking around PCAM. And I reserve this patient because he's my most important. His image shows you two things. The reflective quality right around the nerve shows me that he's young. Young retinas shine. These little dots over here, these show me that he has significant disease and he is perhaps microns away from diabetic macular edema and losing his vision by the time he is 40. This is the patient. These are all the patients that we want to help. So yes, we are uniquely positioned to provide value. We know that we can interrupt the course of a devastating disease, and we know that we can do it right here at Penn.